John, thanks for taking the time to meet today. Excited to dig into some operations goodness. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Excellent. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand. Um, I heard first heard about you or heard you speak, I guess, on the Startup CPG podcast. I just heard the podcast a couple months ago. You said that you recorded it back in April, but it was phenomenal podcast. You shared a lot of great insights. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, you know, get some lightning in a bottle again today during our conversation. Hopefully you can share some awesome tips with the group here. Yeah, I appreciate that. Happy you enjoyed it. It's uh, all it means is I've been been around for a long time. It doesn't mean that I'm great at anything. It just <laughs> seen a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's like uh, what is um, Woody Allen's quote is 80% of success is just showing up. So yep. it sounds like you've just been showing up for enough years that you've got a lot of wisdom to share, which is awesome. Trying. Awesome. Well, let's just start off, John. Tell us um, about yourself and how you got started in the CPG space. Sure. So my first stint in the CPG space was working for a candy company called Pez a long time ago, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. which, which is, it's hard for me to say that and not have someone smile on the other end of the conversation because it goes back to childhood illness right away. Um, and it was just kind of an interesting space. You know, I had never, I didn't study in college. I mean, it's, it's in college, I studied business marketing. And here I took over a job at, at a candy company purchasing stuff. And I had no idea what I was doing, to be candid. I had no idea what packaging was, what production was, what inventory was, and warehouses. But I love connecting dots. So it really didn't take too long. So I got into the space that way. And then I fortunately, yeah, grew that really, really fast, that company in about three years. And then got my first step into the beverage industry. So I worked for Vitamin Water um, just prior to the acquisition by Coca-Cola. And it was a wild ride. And I just fell in love with the space uh, on the young brands. And I just knew I always wanted to be in that space in some capacity again, earlier in. Um, Ironically, after that, I went to go work for PepsiCo, which is not that, but it's a $65 billion machine that for seven years paid me to learn is the way I talk about it. That's cool. And, um, and then from there, kind of just got back into the small, small spaces and started, started with a, you know, an $8 million brand after leaving PepsiCo. And you know, we turned that company around and rebuilt it from the ground up um, and sold it to Vita Coco. And then other companies after that. And it's just been, it's been a lot of fun. And to talk how I got into what I'm doing now, it, a lot of it is because I don't know how to say no. So people <laughs> often ask me questions like, how do you do this thing? Or who can I contact for this idea or this co-pack or whatever it is? And um, I started to, to help folks just casually, uh, not for pay, not for business, because I was working full time. Mm -hmm. And fast forward, it just became something that became very, very obvious to me that while the sales and marketing of a business is super exciting, and I have a marketing background from education, I should say anyway, and I'm married to a marketer who builds brands, um, you can have all the, you can have the sexiest marketing and sales happening in the world, but if you can't get product on the shelf and your unit economics are broken, it's not going to last long. And I had been a part of many a handful of brands, whether I worked for them or advised them that were amazing brands, amazing products. And when they always failed, when, when the wheels fell off the bus, it wasn't because they didn't have placement. It wasn't for any other reason other than unit economics and operations. And I just saw that as an opportunity. And it's not something that, it's not something that is, it's hard. It's not hard if you know it, but if you don't know it, sometimes it can be challenging to wrap your mind around it. And mm -hmm. <laughs> able to see around the corner of what what are these early decisions that I'm making now how will that impact me 12 to 18 months from now yeah, and, yeah. you know so I've taken those battle scars and said well let's just build a company around that and help brands to do that so they can scale their business so we can provide the framework for their business to grow okay cool man there's a lot that you said there that I want to, that I want to follow up on first of all the comment that you made about Pez um, when you said that, when you share that with someone there, they instantly start smiling. You said that as I was smiling, cause it's totally true. Like you say the word yeah. Pez and you instantly just start thinking about the first dispensers you had when you're, when you were a kid and the ones sure. that maybe you held on to that you've got like in some random box that you take with you from house to house. 
move to move because it has sentimental value. So that's cool that you got your start at a company that has such strong, has like such a strong brand and has such strong ties with our lives. So that's really, that's really cool. Um, you mentioned something about, and I, I'm, par- I'm par- paraphrasing, but you said that one of the things or one of the big reasons that you see brands fail is because their unit economics and kind of the operation side can't keep up with the demand that's generated by the marketing, right? And that's something that we talk about a lot at Fiddle. It's something that um, I think brands talk about behind the scenes. I feel like the operations and the sales stuff and scaling and growing like that um, is feels like it might be like a little sexier and that's why people talk about it more. But the operation stuff, like you said, is the undergirding part of it that kind of you know, enables the rest of it to grow. I also feel like it's kind of a cart before the horse question, right? Like sometimes brands are, it's all that they can do to, um, to just focus on getting product out the door today. And they don't want to like bring in more inventory or worry about things if they're not going to, if, if they can't actually sell it yet. And so what do you typically tell a brand kind of that's in that situation or, or I guess maybe taking a couple steps back, like, um, how do they kind of balance that? how do they strike a balance between the marketing stuff and then knowing when they do need to start making improvements or changes to the operations, if that makes sense and kind of when to do it. Yeah, for sure. I would say that, that I don't think there's any company that's or any brand that starts up that can't uh, do some good basics in regards to housekeeping and I'm not pushing fiddle, but I know what you guys do. Right. So at a minimum, like you should be really organized just to know like, where's my stuff? Like how much stuff do I have? Where is it? What is the value of it? Just, just stay organized. So if you, if you've got mm-hmm. that, it's like, that's a great box to check. That means you, you, you're you not just doing things haphazardly because as you scale and grow, you need to stay organized with things. But I would say that, you know, some of the advice that, that I've been given and I continue to give it when, when brands are in those early stages is, um, talk to me about your, your sales channel strategy. Uh, and I know that sounds strange coming from someone that works in operations, but it's, yeah. it's really important because in my opinion, because, you know, you can, it's really exciting to think that you can be a national brand, but it's really hard to be a national brand. Um, it's not just getting it into UNFI, you know, there is, trade spend and marketing and field sales. And aside from the fact that you're talking tens of millions of dollars to do that, um, it's hard to build a supply chain around something that doesn't have the support on the front end uh, to pull it through. So I, I'll, I'll often say, talk to me about your sales plan. Like, What is your channel strategy? What is your geographical strategy? Because then that will dictate a little bit around what does the operations need to support it today, tomorrow, two years from now. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we start. Okay. That totally makes sense. So you kind of start with what their future plans are and kind of what sales channels are planning to go into. And then that helps, you know, okay, if you're going into X sales channel, then you, then you know that the operations needs to be up to a certain level. And if it's not, that's something you, you got to take care of and kind of get dialed in first before you ambitiously start to grow into more sales channels. For sure. And when you're early in as well, this, you know, if you had all the great, the greatest strategy in the world, it doesn't mean that you can execute it. What I mean by that is, you know, good example is, uh, you know, we, we've supported quite a few brands that launched during the pandemic and have done phenomenally well, but they, it's been extremely challenging to stand up their supply chain and operations in a way that is strategic because of the lack of supply of co-packers, materials, ingredients, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what what I'm getting at is it's not uncommon to to early in to make decisions on partners because they're the only ones available. While strategically, they may not be the right partners. But what's important to know is, and we give this advice all the time, don't, don't sign away your soul to that partner because they're your partner for now, not necessarily your partner for the future, um, but it's not uncommon. And you know, you take steps. We've seen brands that, that we have purposely put them into 
co-packer A or co-packer B, knowing that they're absolutely going to outgrow them, but it's what was available. Mm. And it wasn't in the right place geographically, but it's what was available. So it, it's tough. It's tough. It's, it's a bit of a balancing act. You know, that it's rare that someone comes out of the gate well-funded, well-staffed, has all the has all the channel strategy ironed out. All the distributors are waiting for it, where you can just lay out a roadmap. It's, I mean, it's I worked for Coke and Pepsi. They barely can figure that out. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so what you're saying is, cut yourself some slack to the brands out there. Don't try to do it all perfectly. It's okay if you have some hiccups, if you have some mistakes and some missteps, because even the biggest brands do. So take some comfort sure. in that. Yeah, sure. that totally sure. makes sense. Um, along those lines, there's a couple follow-ups that I want to ask to that. One would be, um, what do you feel like COVID has done? And you already mentioned, and obviously all of us kind of know how it's affecting the supply chain and that sort of thing. But how do you think, I guess, from like a, uh, maybe from a strategy standpoint or from a kind of a mindset, like how do you think brands need to approach their operations given the restraints of COVID? Sure. Uh, not that I'm happy that COVID came upon the earth, <laughs> but uh, a comment before I answer your question, it's probably the first time, at least in my career, that the term supply chain became a sexy word. And it became a sexy <laughs> word when yeah. no one could get toilet paper. Right? Yeah. And nobody could get their, their essentials. Like, what do you mean you're out of soap? You know, it just doesn't register because as consumers, we just, we just buy it. Um, so kind of good for our business, I should say, but <laughs> terrible for the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it just exacerbates some of the things that, that I've been fortunate to be educated on through working for, you know, Coke and Pepsi and some of these brands is, is, is making sure you've got alternative sources of supply of anything. Um, and even more so try not to have unless you have no other option, try not to have something from an ingredient point of view, from a packaging point of view, that is so unique that there's only one place in the world to get it. Because mm. that happens and that's okay. But when the world shuts down and you can't get a boat through the Suez Canal, you're in a business. Just, it happens. So it, you know, it, if you can try to have, you know, secondary tertiary backup suppliers for everything, great. Um, try not to be overly unique. It's a whole marketing discussion, which I'm happy to chat about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All. But uh, that, that'd be my recommendation. And it's, um, and it's hard because as founders working with lots of founders, whether I've worked for them or now working at, you know, as an outsourced team for them, um, they're brilliant. And I, I always wish them congratulations because they've created something from nothing that people want. Uh, that's the hard part. Like, what we do is easy. There's only so many ways to run a business. Uh, but, you know, so it's hard to not be creative is my point when you're a founder, because that's how you started this thing, right? For sure. Okay. So making sure that you've got backup suppliers, backup co-manufacturers that you can lean on if you need to, and then yeah. not over innovating, like not, like not making your product so special and so unique that there's no option for backup suppliers because there's only one place to get it. And you're basically your entire business hinges on that. Yeah. And that's, okay. that's a very, absolutely. And that's very tactical for sure. Sure. The more strategic part of it, which is something that um, myself and my team really pride ourselves on. And there's other people that are definitely very good at it is, is relationship management. What I mean by that is foster strong relationships with all of your partners, whether you're contractually obligated with them or not. Because when the times are tough, if you don't have a good relationship with them, if you have a transactional relationship with them, they don't care about you. Mm. But not to say you need to wine and dine people, I don't mean that. But there's there's a way of, of maintaining a professional relationship with folks that they're happy to pick up your call when their phone shows your number versus crap, I, John Chiroli's calling and I don't really want to pick this up. <laughs> Um, so there's something to be said about that. And that's, that's kind of an art you build or over th through your career. Um, it's critically important. Okay. What are some ways to do that during COVID time when maybe it's harder to meet in person and obviously things are 
or they were opening back up and maybe they're starting to close back down or we don't quite know what's going to happen. But you mentioned that you don't have to be like talking to them all the time and that sort of thing. But what are some um, ways that, you know, like your average brand could just maintain that consistent relationship with their partners? I mean, it's just like the sales team on the other side. Like, don't don't just call someone when you need something. Right? Mm, it's okay to sure. call. It's okay to text someone and say, "How how was your day?" I know that sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's 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 so valuable. Like, so it's it's like when people are looking for a new job opportunity. It's like I have to update my LinkedIn and start to reach out. No, you should be doing that all the time, mm. so that when it's time that you need something. Everyone's excited and happy to be there for you, not just, I need something, please help me. For and, sure. You know, that's, that's something that, you, in my experience, you learn, you sometimes learn the hard way. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I want to go back to something that you said a few minutes ago. You, you said something like uh, that some brands sell their soul to their partner, to their co-packer, right? Yeah. I want to dig into that a little bit more because obviously in certain situations, like you said, you know, you, you just, you just don't have a lot of choices as far as who you choose to be your co-packer, who you choose to be your supplier, because, you know, just whatever constraints are in place. Right. But what are some um, kind of some red flags to look for um, that would, that would indicate I'm about to sell my soul to this company and it's not going to be good for me a few years down the road. You know what I mean? For sure. I I, I appreciate whilst I'll get into some specifics, but I appreciate why some brands sometimes do that because they don't have the capital. Um, mm. So you may say, hey, I'll, I'll give you half my company if you do this thing for us. Or I promise you that I will commit to X million widgets of production over the next two, three, four, five years. Um, because I'm well-funded and I can afford to do that. Those are, those are tough calls. I mean, those are, those are things where I would say, you know, spend the time to take a look at your multi-year plan as best as it's laid out, right? And your cash and your cash burn and what you're expecting. And, and is it realistic to know that I'm going to reach a milestone where that's not going to hurt me? Um, if, you, if you're doing, you know, one of these and saying, yep, we're going to get there. And <laughs> I know at scale, it's just going to work out. That's the kiss of death. Do the work to know that it, you're putting yourself at risk or not. Um, and hang on to as much equity as you can for as long as you can. If you don't need to give it away, don't give it away. Unless, unless it's a real strategic reason to do it. You know, if you're building your business and you're going to sign on the, the most amazing distributor that's perfect for your business and your channel, maybe you give them some skin in the game because they're really going to explode your business. It's more strategic in nature. But if you're just giving it away because you don't have the cash, I feel for you. That's hard. <laughs> I, that's hard. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Tell me what, you, what are some things, and you kind of already mentioned um, some of the basics that brands need to be taken care of as far as making sure, and on the, I guess, taking a few steps back on the startup CPG podcast, I think you call it inventory control and you use the analogy of the peanut butter and jelly. If you're selling peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you need to know how much peanut butter you have, how much jelly you have and how much bread you have and when it expires and how much it costs and all that stuff, right? Those yeah. are just like the very basics of managing your inventory, both your supplies and your finished goods and that sort of thing. What sure. are some things, um, what are some things that, that you see brand, I guess beyond that, that you see brands are doing right when it comes to in, um, in inventory operations and then some things you see them doing wrong, feel free to kind of interchange that as they come to mind. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll echo some of the things from the, from the other podcast. It's, it's just knowing how much stuff you have and knowing, um, knowing what it takes to, to build your thing. Right. So I'm going to use PB and J as the example, but we use a beverage, you know, it's, yeah. if you've got 10 ingredients and two bits of packaging and your bill of materials tells you that, you know, you need all of these things to make a minimum order quantity run. If you're missing one, you might as well be missing all of them. Right. So ha- being able to, to understand just holistically, and I know it sounds basic, but every time I go into a production, I need to have this many things to make my finish good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see brands doing a pretty good job of that. What I see brands also doing a pretty good job of is even using some tools, whether it's Excel or 
Um, you know, we've seen great tools like Union Crate. Um, some of our brands use those, where it gives you some of the demand, and then you back that demand into okay, from a supply chain procurement point of view, what is the what's my uh, lead time on all my individual items, and what's my sales velocity on the demand side, and and marrying those together to know that okay, when I dip below this quantity on my finished goods, it should trigger me in an Excel sheet, it could be, you know, it turns red, buy more of these things. Yeah. If it's, if it's in the ERP, it's time to buy more of these things. But lot code traceability is also important too, because especially early in, and you mentioned it, um, you don't want to lay up a lot of working capital in inventory. So it, it is a fine balance. So it's, I see, that's probably something I see brands doing well and not well. It's, it's, mm. it's challenging. And it's one of those things, if you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to do it. You just buy stuff. You know, we, have brand, we have a brand now that I won't mention their name, but they're phenomenal. They're just getting off the ground where some, one of our, our mature team members said, Hey, FYI, we just uncovered that these seven tons of stuff that they have expires in October and they're going to go into production in October. Well, that's not going to work. Right? No. The manufacturer is going to produce something in their plant when you send them materials that are expired. So it's like really like keeping track of your stuff, knowing as best as you can, what are your sales velocities and how does that tie into your lead time on your raw material inventory um, is, is something that we see brands doing well and not well. Okay. Gotcha. So it's kind of like both, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. Like these are the things that they're doing well, but then sometimes they're not doing these things well. Or a better way to say it is get good at that thing. Right. Get good at that thing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You mentioned, um, and obviously I think this is the case for any business, like when you first start out, you use spreadsheets for as many things as possible because they're simple, they're free for the most part and, yeah. you know, um, easily manipulatable, if that's the right word. You can, you know, you, you, you can do what it, you can make them basically do whatever you want. You're only limited by your own knowledge as, as like, uh, like how the, the spreadsheets work. So sure. I've got a couple of questions about this, but my first one is um, for someone like me who is a very who is a um, is not very um, is not very like savvy with spreadsheets. Let's say, how do you are, are there like any templates out there, or like any like systems out there that you can use to create like a solid spreadsheet to start tracking all the like the different things that you mentioned? Uh, some some of the stuff. I would say I haven't seen a basic template for just inventory. I mean, it's some of that stuff is as simple as, you know, columns of, you know, class, packaging, ingredients, you know, subclass, whatever it is, you know, what's the unit of measure and just kind of setting it up and thinking about it in a logical point of view it, as far as like how you buy it, you know, how does the supplier, I almost think about it this way because this is how I built it very early in my career is, you get a proposal from your supplier, whatever the thing is, they're going to tell you it's, they're going to tell you the unit of measure they're, they're charging you or they're quoting you. They're going to tell you the size of that, uh, size of that, that unit, you, you know, it comes in a pallet of a thousand or comes in a bucket of 40 pounds, whatever it is. Um, they're going to give you their manufacturing part number. Um, they're going to give you a lot code. So that's, that's kind of the basics of, what, what's, what do I have just to organize it? Mm -hmm. But as far as the other stuff, as far as, you know, demand and those types of things, um, you know, I've seen, seen some tools floating around Google Sheets, Google Docs, that kind of thing. Um, we build tools, min max tools for brands where it, you know, ties everything together. So all they have to do is dump in my, their velocities and it just explodes and says, here's what you need to do, or here's how many things oh, you have to cool. have. Um, so we build those early tools in, which are just, all they are is the precursor to going to an ERP, which an ERP does that, right? Sure, right, but right. Having it, having it built from the beginning and having all the right, um, all the right framework set up for it makes it easier when you graduate one day to some type of ERP because you're going to sure. have to put in MLQ, lead times, lot codes, item numbers, descriptions. So that's, that's the stuff that, uh, you know, I haven't seen tons of just available templates. I mean, we build them. We 
imagine you guys do some like that stuff too. I don't know, mm. but um, just be organized. I know it sounds basic, but yeah, there's almost infinite columns in Excel. You can just keep having <laughs> you know something in there and go online and learn how to do a pivot and figure out how to make sense out of that data. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That totally makes sense. And you had you had talked about that in the in the other podcast too. That no amount of organization is going to or no like software is going to save you from a lack of organization, right? Because if anything, it's just going to um, it's just going to basically throw gas on that fire of disorganization. And I think that's true for a lot of software. Marketing software is kind of what my background has been in, and it's definitely true for that. People that didn't that don't have clear marketing and sales processes, the software doesn't help them get clear on that. It, it, it just helps you automate what's what you're doing. So if you're not doing anything right, or if you're not, you know, organized with what you're doing, then it's not going to really help you that much with that. And so that totally makes sense to me from an operation standpoint as well with the, um, you know, you want to make sure you've got all that stuff structured and or, organized at least as much as possible before you shift over into using software. And that's actually a good segue question because you've got a lot of experience with this but at what point do you typically recommend brands switch from using software or sorry switch from using a spreadsheet to track their operations things um, inventory control and that sort of thing to using software if you've got the right folks in house helping you um, and when I say right that they're organized or you're organized as the founder um, you're able to track your inventory, lock code, know when to buy stuff, you know, process orders and, and know where all your things are. Um, I mean, I would say up to probably 20, 25 million, you're fine with QuickBooks and Excel. Uh, okay. If you're on, you know, if you're up to 20, 25 million with, with line of sight to being, you know, 30 to 50, that's the time, in my opinion. Because um, if you're organized up to that point, you've made it, right? And you've yeah. Made it. Well, now to just to echo what you already said, then you're just going to exacerbate some good process and some and some great organization and jump into a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and all you're doing is is just transferring that data into a system that can take some of the thinking, some of the automation, excuse me, some of the manual processes out, uh, so you can be more efficient running your business. Gotcha. Okay. I'm actually surprised to hear hear you say that a brand could take it up to, I think you said 20 or 25 million in revenue just off of Excel and QuickBooks. And I guess if it's, like you said, if it's a person that knows what they're doing and has like the right, the right system set up that those two things really can take you farther than you think they can. Yeah. We've got, we've got two, two brands right now that are North of that dollar amount and it's QuickBooks and Excel. Wow. Or QuickBooks and Google Sheets. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, I, it just goes to show it's not about the, it's not about the bike, right? That's what Lance Armstrong always said. It's about, it really isn't about the tool. It's about the person that's using the tool and how much they can maximize the value from it. So, but yeah, cool. Now, really it cool. does make life easier once you're there. Yeah. But know how to get there. For sure. For sure. Um, I wanted to shift gears to some rapid fire questions. Um, sure. And sure. short then. Yeah, keep it. I mean, keep it as short as you want to. I don't think most of these questions re require too 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 long of an answer. So, um, what is a favorite tool or resource that you're using right now? It, it could be software or something along those lines. Uh, we're liking Katana. We're liking Sin Seven um, from an inventory point of view. Somewhat runs the business a little bit. So those are some of the tools that we like. Okay, cool. Um, what is one of your favorite books? This could be any type of book. Any type of book. I would say my favorite book is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. I'm actually curious to know why that's one of your favorites. It's, it's very much, it's a, it allows me to see a different mindset in business. Okay. Um, a mindset that I grew up around from an entrepreneurial point of view. And I probably read it once or twice a year. Oh, wow. Very and cool. If, okay. If I'm in a long haul drive on vacation, I'll listen to it on Audible. Just because it just, for me and my business and growing businesses, it just, uh, just realigns my mindset. Very cool. Yeah, that's a book that I, 
that's, I think that's gotta be one of the first, um, kind of like self-help business books that I read. Um, when I got out of college, someone recommended me that book when I was in sales and it's one that I've gone back to a few times as well. So I think that's a solid choice. Um, what is a favorite quote that you have that maybe guided you at different points of your life? A favorite quote. Let's think about that. Or if it helps, it could be like some kind of a, like a, like a phrase or reminder that you say to yourself. It doesn't have to be like an actual formal quote. No, I actually, I, I'm trying to remember what it was. It's actually Simon Sinek. It's, I'm mm. going to not get it hundred percent right. People don't buy what you do. They buy what you believe. Mm. Right? They don't buy what you sell. They buy what you believe. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer of that, you know, through my career and through my life, it's, People are attracted to you because of what you believe uh, in business often, at least the, at least the people that for me, I want to have, sur- have myself surrounded with. Sure. Uh, everyone will work for a dollar, right? Everyone's good for, for pay, but when someone believes in what you're doing, they'll walk through fire for you. Yeah, that's huge. If someone believes in what you're doing, they'll walk, they'll walk through fire for you. That's powerful. That's super powerful. Um, who is someone in the food and beverage industry? And you're probably, I mean, you've been around for a while and you've worked for a lot of companies and obviously consulting with a lot of brands, but is there someone out there that you haven't met or that you would, that you would like to take to lunch that you just think is doing really awesome things? Uh, let's see. Who would I like to take to lunch? It's doing awesome things. Not that I've met everyone, but I've been fortunate to meet <laughs> a lot of the people that I want to. Um, <laughs> Well, that's a tough one. I've been, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of folks. That's a tough one. Okay. Who, I mean, yeah. So this is, this is uh this is a, probably a good follow-up then like who, who, who out there right now that you know of is just doing really um, important or innovative things that you think, you know, people should be following or that they should be paying attention to. So a couple of people come to mind. One is my old boss. I mean, I worked for Christina Tosi at Milk Bar and, you know, she's full of innovation and, and, and brilliance and just uh, doing some interesting things that are just making people happy, right? People just like delicious, indulgent stuff and she just does a great job at it. So that's, that's kind of fun. Um, so she comes to mind for sure. Uh, you know, I would say, and not to be biased, but you know, client of ours, uh, brands called Poppy. You know, so Stephen and Allison Ellsworth, I think they're just really doing an amazing job in giving people an alternative option to sodas that are absolutely delicious mm. and, and actually good for you. Um, so it's and it's great, and they're just they're just crushing it in the space. So you know th- those are the kind of folks that I think are really doing some interesting things for sure. Um, yeah, but those are those two to come to mind. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'd love to just wrap up um, by asking you to tell us more about your current business. Is it pronounced Armatura? Armatura, depending on the accent that you use, I guess. If you did a pretty good job because it is an Italian great word. So yes, that is cool. The Cool. So, you know, what's in a name? I mean, the reason I named it that is, by definition, that word means that it's it's a structure that's built around a framework that's mm. built around a model um, as it's being constructed. So, if you've ever seen, it's almost, almost like scaffolding, right? So, if, cool. you know, to be able to cr- to be able to create whatever the sculpture is, you have to have this framework around it to support it as it, as it grows. So that was the nature of, of the name. So we, we are an out, we're a team of outsourced operations folks and we help bring brands to life. So it could be as little as I need a co-packer or I was just on Shark Tank and my business is exploding and I don't have a supply chain and we need to stand one up really, really quick. Those are the things that we do. So across the board, supply chain, uh, making sure that all of our, our clients are working with the right partners, the right relationships, and they've got longevity and they've got, they've got line of sight into the cost of goods management. 
so they can continue to run this business, whatever the business is. That's that's a lot high level. That's a lot of the stuff that we do. Okay, that's fantastic. And I think a lot of the people listening to this podcast, um, you know, if not now, at some point, could use those type those types of services. So what's the what's the best way to connect with you or to reach you if they're interested in following up about that? Sure. I mean, you can definitely reach out to us via LinkedIn. We're on. You can reach out to us on our website, which is Armatura co.com you could reach out to us on all, all the social platforms you can find us on, on uh, tiktok on instagram whatever whatever you all like over. likely we're there so and we'll probably be at expo east walking around meeting some folks, okay. folks from awesome catch up. assuming that 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 show actually happens we'll see fingers crossed man we need yeah. live events again we need them yeah so we'll be there We'll be there. It'd be exciting. Okay, cool. So my my last question, this popped into my mind earlier in our conversation when you mentioned that your spouse is a brand marketer. So brand marketing op, op, operation side on your end, when are when are you launching your own product to take to take take over the CPG world together? Yeah, I'm not smart enough to do that. <laughs> That's not true. Come on. It's uh it's uh it it's it's hard like i said you know creating something from nothing that people want is hard yeah taking an order putting it on a truck shipping it out paperwork documentation in theory that stuff's easy if you know how to do it so um so who knows you know we uh we talk about stuff often but cool she's fun having fun doing her thing i'm having fun doing my thing and keeps keeps for a happy home and that's cool nice yeah that's awesome well john i definitely appreciate um your time is there anything else you want to share Are there any questions i didn't ask that you feel like i should have asked or any kind of parting words you want to share with the audience uh i, I think you did a great job of drilling me so good job <laughs> i would say you know parting words are just you know keep up the good work i mean it's it's not not every brand's going to make it but don't be afraid to ask questions of anyone. Surround yourself with people that have failed as much as yeah. people that have succeeded. Because I've learned more from failure than I have from success. And that's what I would say. Cool. All right. I love it. All right, John. Well, thank you again for taking the time. And we'll chat again later. All right. Be well. Thank right. you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye.